Now it is time to introduce our main speaker for tonight, Billy. I'm Billy, I'm an alcoholic. Um, probably will mention drugs as well. Uh, my sober date is June 18th, 1995, and to save you doing the math, that gives me just a little over 17 years. And, and I have to say, just tonight, I hear people say uh, time means nothing, but to see a dude take a cake for 51 years, don't tell me that means nothing. Congratulations. That's, that's, it's an honor to see that. And congratulations to everyone else who took a cake. Um, birthdays are a big deal. I was told that it's for the other alcoholic, not for you. Um, which makes sense to me, you know, when you're, when you're new and there's new people in the room, if you pick up a 30-day chip, the guy with 15 days needs to know how you did that. So that's why you're taking a 30-day chip. Um, fuck, Rodeo Drive. I've lived in LA, um, in case you haven't cottoned on yet, I'm not American. Uh, I'm a transplant from England and I've lived there for 15 years and I've dodged this bullet. I've never spoken at Rodeo Drive. And this meeting has, it's kind of legendary. And if you're confused why it's called Rodeo Drive, which I would be if I was new and I'd say, let's go to Rodeo Drive meeting and it's on Hillcrest. What is this, Hillcrest? Hillguard. You know, why is it called Rodeo Drive? This meeting used to be on Rodeo Drive. And before I actually moved there, I was working here and, uh, you know, any, I've been to meetings everywhere in the world. And uh, if you mention Rodeo Drive, people will go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. You know, I've heard of that. So when I came here the very first time to Los Angeles, I thought, well, I'll go to this Rodeo Drive meeting. Now, you know, the phrase, we are not a glum lot, doesn't apply to English people. Um, meetings in London are not this, okay? Especially not 17 years ago. So when I came here, <laughs> this meeting was on Rodeo Drive, which, you know, is fabulous, and it's all Chanel and Gucci and all that shit. And, uh, and then I walk into this room, and there's 500 people in there. There's a guy playing the piano, okay? We don't, I mean, it was a commitment. It was an official AA commitment. When he played Happy Birthday, it was all flourishy and fabulous, you know, and, and I'd never seen this microphone at an AA meeting. And I'm sitting in there going, fuck, you know, this is incredible. This is like, this is not London. You know, we're all miserable and have got bad teeth and it's raining. Um, so I liked LA, AA from the get-go. Um, but the Rodeo Drive meeting has this thing and uh, it was sad to sit down there and hear the the treasurer dude say um, that it's falling behind on rent because, you know, this, this meeting has to continue, just has to continue. So, yeah, that was, that was a little downer when I heard that. Um, but anyway, here I am speaking at Rodeo Drive. Uh, I identify as an alcoholic. And the reason for that, by the way, any, anything I say is just me. I'm not standing up here because I'm the president of AA or part of the Politburo or whatever it is. I'm just another junky guy that's done what, kind of done what they told me to do and I'm still here. Um, so whatever I say is my, my own personal experience, probably throw in an opinion or two even though I try not to, you know. They're like assholes, we've all got them. Um, and for me, I suffer from the disease of alcoholism. That has nothing to do with alcohol. It's the name that my disease has. And I treated my disease with alcohol and drugs for many years. Um, there are a lot of 12-step fellowships and you know, I, I qualify for 90% of them. But I choose to come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I want my 12 steps uncut, 
you know, like, like my drugs. I like my drugs pure and uncut, and I want my 12-step program pure and uncut. This is, in Alcoholics Anonymous, you hear the shit that Bill and Bob devised. That's what I need. Um, so I identify as an alcoholic, but, um, you know, I, I, I was a heroin addict, that's it. And, uh, and I want to clarify something else before we go down this road, is that you don't have to have taken heroin. It doesn't matter what your drug of choice is. It matters how you feel. Um, when, I, when I was a kid, I never felt like I belonged on this planet. You know, it was never good enough. I was either too fat or too thin or you know, too poor. I never quite felt like I fit in. And the use of drugs and alcohol cured that for me. So if you're, you know, if you're sitting there and, and, and you drink alcohol and you, you know, you're trying to stop drinking alcohol or you're trying to stop smoking pot or whatever it is, it's the same shit. It's all the same shit. It's alcoholism. So just because my story is what it is, um, you know, I urge you to try and look past that if it's not yours. Um, okay. trying to think when I was sitting there what it was like to be a newcomer because I saw a lot of newcomers stand up and most of the times there's a few who don't stand up and when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous for the very first time you know we use weird language around here um, when I was using I was homeless and I didn't ever you know if there was a problem with the, the homeless guy next door to me I would never say to him, excuse me, but I have a resentment against you. Um, and I think you owe me an amends. <laughs> this is not language that we use out there. And it can be intimidating when you come in as a newcomer. Um, the word God. Trust me, when, when I came in here, I was not a guy that used the word God. You know, that can be intimidating too. When they say, read the, read the big book, that shit's written, it's difficult. For an alcoholic like me to read it, it's difficult. It's all thee and thou and, and like, it's weird the first time you read it. And I urge you to look past that shit because uh, for someone like me to still be here 17 years later is an absolute miracle. I... I knew I wanted to be a heroin addict from the moment that punk rock came out, which is really sad. Um, like I said, I never fit in, and uh, I couldn't quite figure it out. You know, I was caught sti When I was about nine, and I've just thought of this, and there's something wrong with me. I, I was nine years old, and I was going around the neighborhood. You know the badges on the back of cars that say, I don't know, Ford or Volkswagen. I was stealing them. And uh, I don't know why. And I got caught. Um, I was stealing shit from an early age from, from stores. And I was always getting into trouble and I couldn't figure out what was going on with me. And then, you know, punk rock came out. Punk rock came out. And, uh, and I watched the TV. I was living in England in 1977. And... Uh, I watched the TV and I saw a bunch of, a bunch of kids who couldn't play, and that was good because I then realized that I didn't have to play either, I could just pretend. And they were spitting and swearing, which was all good for, you know, my parents were pissed off and I, I was like, oh, okay, I see how to get underneath your skin. And it just, a big light bulb went off. Um, so my heroes, when I was growing up, were, well, <laughs> My heroes are now all dead. And that tells me something too. But at the time, I would see pictures of these guys in magazines with, uh, there was something about their skin was gray and like translucent. And their eyes were, it was like, it was, when I looked at pictures of like Johnny Thunder, it, it, there's probably no one in here who even knows who Johnny Thunders is. But, Let's go Keith Richards and Sid Vick. Well, Keith is alive still, but he's different. Um, you, got, you know, you got Jimi Hendrix and Sid Vicious and, and Janis Joplin and all these people that are now dead. They had this look. And the look to me said, you can't fucking touch me. I'm going to swear as well. Sorry. Um, you can't touch me. 
and it was intriguing to me and I would read these interviews and they would mention heroin and and uh, when I was just coming up to 15 years old, I was going to see a bunch of bands and one of these bands, we were hanging out in a squat in Brixton in South London and one of them pulled out some, some smack and, said, and looked at me and said, you know, have you done this before? <laughs> and I went, yeah, yeah, I've done this before, yeah, yeah, all the time, you know, like 15 <laughs> year old kid. And uh, yeah, he shot me up. That was the first drug I ever took. I, actually, that, that's a lie. I, I'd figured out sniffing in, in England, we have what's called Tipex. Over here, it's called white out. It's the stuff that you white out. And it comes with a bottle of thinners, which is basically, I don't know, like alcohol or something. But if you poured it on your tie in school and <gasps> sniffed it, you'd get high. So I guess that was the first drug that I took. But I was just waiting for someone to offer me some, some heroin, and they did, and I loved it. And from that day, I just ran with it, man. It's what I was looking for, you know? I felt funny, I felt attractive, I felt my parents could just go jump off a cliff, you know? I mean, I was battling with them from as far back as I can remember, and now it didn't matter. I took this thing, and the world became a place that I could exist in. And I, I was, I mean, I didn't, I hadn't, I hadn't obviously done my research because I didn't understand about getting habits or, or what they call cold turkey or feeling shit off this stuff. All I knew is it gave me the look I wanted, which is, you know, still a problem to this day. I mean, you know, LAAA is full of skinny, good looking people dressed in Gucci. And it's not good for the ego because. I'm, I'm just another alcoholic who looks around me and goes, I'm not skinny enough, I don't have the right things. And drugs take that away from me, you know? But so does shopping, so does sex, you know? So does anything in abundance takes that feeling away from me. So there I am, I'm, I'm 15, 16, and I'm running around, and uh, uh, the, there's an interesting phenomenon. I used to tell people, um, you know, early 20s, that they would say, well, what do you do? This just before I became homeless, and I'd say, oh, yeah, I'm a musician. I'm a guitar player. I didn't own a guitar, and I wasn't in a band, <laughs> and I couldn't really play. But I would tell people that's what I did. And not, not till I sobered up, did that become a reality for me, you know? Um, it's amazing what happens when you put the drugs and drink down. So it, uh, in England, they, uh, they have state-run treatment centers. I know there's people in here that are in treatment centers. You can tell them because they, uh, they look cool. They look cool. And, uh, you know, if you're anything like me, when I went to treatment, I mean, I went to treatment a lot. Uh, we won't, you know, it's not a competition, but I went more than you. Um, and, you know, I'd sit at the back and I'd have the, uh, the shades on and I'd have the right sneakers on and I'd be like, yeah, dude, have you read page 64? Is that, they got it wrong on there, you know. Or I could do this program in nine steps. I've figured this shit out. Um, now, the problem with that is the reality, if you are, feeling a bit like that is that you're sitting in a church basement on a Friday night with bad lighting. I would urge you to think about that. It's, it's, we don't end up here by mistake. We don't end up here because we're walking down Hill Guard and we see a bunch of other people smoking and go, that looks cool. I wonder, I wonder what's going on in there. And we come in here. You know, we end up here for a reason. Once I, uh, you know, once I'd had enough of going into treatment and the pain was, was, was great enough, I was, I was homeless, and I was homeless properly for about a year. It was actually out here. I'd come out. <laughs> All right, I'm going to jump around, but back up a bit. I came out of one treatment center, and I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I've got, this is my plan, uh, and I'm about three weeks clean. I know what I'm going to do, I, 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 I'm going to make a demo and I'm going to copy it 50 times on cassettes, okay, so I'm dating myself, little cassette tapes, and then I'm going to go to Los Angeles, I'm going to be a rock star. 
So I did that. I, I recorded this, these songs, which were absolute shit, and made some copies and put them in a suitcase and got on a plane to Los Angeles. And within about five days, I was sitting... I mean, I didn't have a clue how it worked out here, but this seemed like a good plan at the time. I was sitting at McDonald's, McDonald's on Hollywood and Highland, and I heard some about six in the morning, and I heard some kid go, I've got some speed. And I turned around, and I just literally out of my mouth came, do you know where to get any smack? And that was it. That was it. I don't even know where them 50 cassette tapes went because they got left in some motel room somewhere, and I was on like a, you know, I was on a run. And, uh, it, you know, I ended up, I ended up homeless. And we won't do a, a, a drug a log because there's, you know, I qualify to be here, trust me. But uh, just, just to paint the picture, down on Alvarado, which is downtown, there used to be, they've cleaned it up now, but it, was, it looked a bit like the shanty towns of Brazil. It was uh, Alvarado and, like, Burlington, Bonnie Bray, that kind of stuff. And they lent pieces of, there's a couple of people in the room who know it, Louis, yeah, and uh, yeah, there you go, six, and, and the, they built these towns, like you would lean bits of cardboard or corrugated iron up against people's fences, and then you'd live in, in the little shape underneath, and I'd, I lived down there a long time, and, um, you know, smoking, I mean, crack was wonderful, what a great invention that was. Um, lasts about four seconds. <laughs> Fuck, you know, I mean, when I think about it and I think of the money and I think of the, the chase that I used to go, I mean, I'd walk up to Hollywood from Sixth and Burlington and panhandle, I don't know why I didn't use the panhandle down there, but I'd come up here and panhandle $20 and then walk back and score a dime bag of heroin and a, and a dime rock of cocaine and then do it all over again. I was doing all that. And, um, you know, this, this, this ended up with me very close to death. I didn't weigh very much, which I thought was attractive, but wasn't. And uh, I was going to die. I wasn't, I wasn't going to die in the way that I hope someone comes and picks me up off the floor and loves me. I was just going to die. Uh, couldn't get a vein, you know, all that, all that kind of bloody gruesome stuff that we hear around here. And uh, I went to a meeting. I went to a meeting. I called a friend up and I went to a meeting. And I believe that the reason it worked this time and not any other time is because for the first time in my life I was ready to do what someone else told me. Fully, fully. I was sick and it's all the phrases and I hate hearing them and I sit down there and there's dudes come up here and go easy does it a day at a time it works if you work it and they're quoting and I'm like shut up and it's all true it's all true um, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired I was so over the lifestyle I'd been leaving, leading it for 14 years I'd done nothing in my life Parents had moved to Africa don't ask why long story but they live in Zimbabwe and it's like huh? Um, I'm an only child, so no brothers and sisters, had no money, no possessions, and I had a, a, a trash bag, no idea what was in it. I'm sure it was really important shit in there, but that was me, the jeans that I had on, the T-shirt I had on, and this plastic bag. And uh, I was just done. And I came into AA, and I believe that God granted me my higher, let's use the word higher power just in case God makes you go like that. My higher power gave me a moment of clarity. The moment of clarity was, if you don't do this, you're going to die. No coming back dying, you know, kind of like gone dying. Because there's a lot of us, or uh, let's talk about just, just me. I wanted to die almost. I wanted someone to come along with my heart stopped and then resuscitate me and go, I didn't realize you were in so much pain. Let me help you and give you a job and some money and a bird and a car. And, and that didn't happen, you know? So 
I was granted a moment of clarity and I was able to hear that um, there's a program available to people. Now, here's another one of my opinions. I don't think that sitting in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous is working a program. I think that that's where I, for me, that's where I come to remind myself that there is a program to work. The program being the 12 steps. Meetings are great. I, I still do four meetings a week. And, and there, you know, there are people in here that will tell you. I'm not that fucking guy again. You know, I, I go to meetings all the time. But my program is in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's, for me, it's outlined in the first 164 pages of the big book. I've heard a bunch of different versions of how to do the 12 step. Interesting, very interesting. Um, how this thing gets distorted and, uh, you know, I'll say to a sponsor, I have sponsees, I have a sponsor, and I'll say to a sponsee, have you done the steps before? And they'll say, yeah. And I'll say, so what did you do for step four? And it'll be, well, we drove out to Magic Mountain and then we uh, ate some cat. Like, people... People make this shit up around here. It's all in the first 164 pages of the big book. It's all there. It tells you exactly what to do. And that's what I did. So I believe that's why I'm here. I also believe that that's why people who have mad years of sobriety, you know, I don't know Jim, but I guarantee he's done the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, he doesn't get 51 years by just coming to meetings. That's for sure. Um, and that was the mistake I'd always made before. I'd go to treatment and I, you know, I mean, I went to treatment one time, once, because we're all clever people. We're all really fuck, really clever people. You'll have to edit this, Dave. And I went, I thought I was so clever. I went to treatment and uh, I photocopied my step four from my last treatment center. <laughs> like most people smuggle drugs. Most people, when they know they're going away for two months, they stick some drugs up. I smuggled a fourth step in. Because I'm really clever. <laughs> and, and my pro, you know, and, and I wonder why I couldn't get the, get the program. Why, why can't I get this? Why are there people getting multiple years of sobriety and I can't get it? And, uh, you know, we are so clever, we'll clever ourselves right into a grave if we're not careful. Um... I've had quite a few people in my life um, had to bury them, you know? So I, uh, so I decide that I'm going to do this thing, and I do the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, surprising things happen. First of all, I haven't had a drink or a drug in 17 years. That's surprising enough as it is. Um, I move to Los Angeles. That's a big deal. It's a big deal for a junkie like me. Um, I want to tell you, uh, I want to talk about faith. Someone was asking me, well, how do you have faith? Let me, t l uh, this is a really important story. I, uh, being English, as we now all understand, there's certain paperwork that you have to do to live here legally. You have to get a green card, and I'm a multiple felon. A lot of us are. And the lawyer says that if you're a multiple felon, you cannot have a green card under any circumstances. So I get lawyers and we're preparing cases and all this stuff and then my date comes and it's nine months away. And uh, you know, if you think about it for a second, nine months is a long time to live with, are they gonna kick me out? And I made a distinct choice and people, again, there are people in this room who will tell you that this is true. Instead of stressing about it, I decided to have some faith and I decided that look, God hasn't brought me this far to just throw me away again, throw me back into that shithole that's London. And uh, what I did instead is I got a lot of sponsees, I went to a meeting a day, all the time. I got commitments, I um, worked the 12 steps myself, I worked them with sponsees and I threw myself into AA. And when the date came around, I walked into this little cubicle downtown with some old woman in there that is, has my fate in her hands and she's got my criminal record in front of her and she says uh, the serenity prayers on the wall 
behind her. And she says, oh, uh, hi there. Um, so have you ever been in, in trouble with the law? And it's all in front of her. And I, and, you know, and I, I said, yeah. Yeah, I said I was young and dumb. And it's been quite a few years since I did that. And they gave me a green card. You know, and my lawyer's jaw dropped. They gave me a green card. And shit happens around here. It really does happen. But you have to have some faith. And faith is not, is not well, I'll do it, providing the outcome's going to be okay. You know, faith is, it's going to be all right no matter what. And when I apply that in my life, I, it, my life is good. You know, I got married in, in, um, in recovery, which again, for someone like me, is absolutely amazing. Um, I got divorced in recovery, which is not amazing. Uh, but shit happens, and uh, you know, we did it with love and respect, and, uh, and, and we're good. That happened only because we both worked the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it was done with love and respect. Um, I have the job of my dreams. And I'm not saying that if you stay sober, you will get all these things. Because when I got sober, I didn't know I wanted these things. You know, if I'd have made a list of stuff that I thought I wanted, it wouldn't have been what I've got right now. I'd have short, I'd have short changed myself. Um... I guess if you're, if you're new around, if you're new around, it's all right if you're texting right now, you know? We've got, you know what's great? They've given it a word, attention deficit disorder. It's perfect for alcoholics. We've now all got ADD because when it suits me and someone said, I mean, I've not been clinically diagnosed with ADD, but if, if I'm doing something wrong, I'm sorry, man, I've got ADD. It's like... We've all, apparently suddenly we're all ADD. It's okay, if you're texting, it's fine. It's, you know, 30 minutes of me talking is a long time when you are new, probably when you're, you know, 30 odd years sober, but it's okay, it's totally fine. Text them, see what she's doing later. Maybe you'll get laid, you know? Um, whatever keeps you coming back, whatever. Surely you're gonna give me a five minute warning soon. Six minutes, okay. <laughs> Whatever keeps you coming back. Um, I love being in Alcoholics Anonymous. It drives me crazy sometimes, you know. Um, it doesn't say in the book that if you put the drink and the drugs down and work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, you'll never have a bad day again. It just doesn't say that. But I cannot think of a circumstance in my life that would be made better if I went and smoked some crack right now. I just can't, and I've tried it, you know. I mean, with all those treatment centers, I'd get clean and I'd be, I'd be having a great day and the sun's shining and I've got a bit of money in my pocket and the thought comes, what would make this better is one pipe just to, just to get me there. And it ends up, three months later, in jail with abscesses on my arm. That's where I end up. I'm not capable of a social, you know, people who sit wine like this with the little finger up, I can't do that. I can't do that. And when I first came in here, I, th I really thought that that's what you were gonna teach me to do. How to shoot smack on Friday nights, just, just Fridays. <laughs> and that's the truth. I mean, I could not, if, if, if Jim had stood up and gone, and I've got 51 years, I'd have gone, Bullshit, how do you do 51 years? He's having a drink on Thursday, just with, just with pasta. How am I ever gonna eat pasta without red wine? Well, the truth of the matter is, first of all, I never ate pasta, because I never had any money. And, you know, I was laughing. <laughs> I was, I'll finish with this. I was laughing and, um, with a friend of mine. He said, how are you doing? I said, you know, there are certain areas of my life that are really not going well right now. And he said, Billy, you have areas of your life. That's a miracle. Just to have areas like relationship, money, work. I didn't have any areas. When I came in, there was one area, and it was a two-block radius downtown, and it was how to get enough money to get more drugs. You know, so I'm blessed that I have areas in my life that can be a little messed up right now. Um, 
I'm really, really grateful to have finally gotten Rodeo out of the way. And uh, thank you for being here.